If you decided to click on this video, it means that you are interested in uh, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, at least if you read the description or the, the title of it. Uh, that might be because you're just interested in it, or it might be that you are taking my class. But either way, uh, we are going to get into kind of the introduction to geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. And uh, kind of what we're trying to answer today is why would we want to specify some kind of tolerancing when we design a part? And then the second question is, since it's geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, which is what we're trying to study, what do we mean by geometric? Why should it be geometric dimensioning and tolerancing? So that's what we're going to try to do today. So let me start with the kind of big picture here that nothing that is made in the real world is ever made actually perfectly. So imperfections are going to happen no matter what it is that we make. Now, there can be bigger imperfections and smaller imperfections, and, uh, you know, but we're never going to eliminate imperfections entirely. So that's kind of my first point here is that just because you want something to be a certain size and shape, it doesn't mean that you're actually going to get that uh, once you've sent it to someone to, to make or, or even if you try to make it yourself, believe it or not. Trying to make things yourself is actually a really good way for you to learn about dimensioning and tolerancing because you learn how hard it is to actually make something exactly like you intended to make it. So it's kind of relatively easy to stick it on a page and say, I want something to be made a certain way. It gets a little bit harder when you actually get into the shop and try to actually make something that way. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be in a shop either. It can be in bigger manufacturing environments as well, like a plant. So, um, so kind of the idea there is perfection is really only an abstract idea. You, you know, we can think of perfection, but we can't actually make things that are truly perfect. And so in the middle of all that, we want to make sure things are functional um, despite their imperfections, right? That's kind of what we're shooting to do. When we do this, there's a bunch of factors that we have to think about, and none of them are going to be fully optimizable. Like you won't be able to make any one thing sort of perfect uh, that you think about. Here are some examples of things you have to think about when you're trying to, to dimension a part and, and tolerance it. Um, fit, assemblability, I like that term right there. It basically means how, um, how easy or, or how possible is it to put the thing together, right? Because anything that you make, you have to figure out what are the steps to put it together. Okay, manufacturability is another factor because that is, you know, whether or not something can even be made with the kinds of uh, processes, or I guess with any process, but particularly with the kinds of processes that you might have in mind to be able to make something. Uh, quality control, that, there's a lot of things that go into that, but one of the big ones is, let's say that you made a part and you need to know whether or not it is good enough, you have to have some sort of metrology that you use to try to measure the thing and can make sure that the quality that comes out of whatever parts you're making is controlled. And of course, cost is sort of the overarching factor that is in everything, because I, you know, it's almost always true that if we can you know, limit the, the cost, if we can make the cost lower on whatever it is that we are trying to do, then we've come up with a better solution. So these are all factors, but the one factor I didn't list in that first bullet is functionality. And the reason I didn't list it there is it's different than the others. You have to have your part, whatever it is that you make, your parts and assemblies must be functional. And what you're trying to do is balance uh, considerations that have to do with the other factors that I listed there. Um, as well as, uh, you know, maybe others that I didn't think of whenever I put together this little list right here. So, um, and at the end of it all, there isn't another person to be doing this other than the person who designs the part to begin with. And we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit more whenever we start talking about, you know, where we actually try to apply our tolerances on parts and kind of talking about that in general terms. We're going to get into why it is that the designer must make those decisions. But, you know, we'll, we'll suffice at this point to say, that no one else in the process kind of has the big picture in mind uh, of how this thing might function and all the different factors that go into it. So it's up to you as a mechanical designer to make sure that when you're setting tolerances on things, you're doing it in such a way that the end result is going to be something that works and then has a good balance of the other factors as well, not least of which is cost. Okay. When we do all of this, um, the drawings that are generated by people who design things, those drawings um, often very literally represent a contract that exists between the person who designed the part and the people who are going to be making it. So that means that if you know the, the, the manufacturer of the part uh, starts making these things, and they deliver you first shipment and you get in there and for some reason they don't work, uh, there's going to be a conversation that's going to have to start you know, somewhere, and the, certainly the manufacturer is not going to want to have to be responsible if something's wrong, and you as a designer don't want to have to be responsible, and the only way of knowing sort of whose fault it was once there's something that doesn't work is that there's a good documentation trail of what the designer asked the manufacturer to make. And so uh, when we do this, it's very, it's very important, and we can, talk, we can be talking about uh, 
large amounts of money that might be at stake whenever, you know, something goes like, you know, for instance, once a manufacturer decides to start mass producing something, they very often have to make things like molds or, um, you know, dyes, things like that, where, you know, they're used to make a whole bunch of different parts. If a mold or a dye ends up being wrong and, you know, and it, it's wrong and yet the, the manufacturer did it in such a way as they're within whatever specs that you called for as a designer, then really that comes back to you as a designer. It wasn't the manufacturer's fault. It ends up being more your fault. And so in all of these um, sort of relationships that happen between the designer and the manufacturer, it's very important that we be able to communicate clearly about what it is that you want as a designer. And that way it even gives you a little bit of cover that if you ask for something properly and you didn't get it, you know, you have someone that you can say, well, it wasn't my fault. It was the fault of the person who actually made it. But if you don't have that trail, it's uh, even though you might want to, it's not really appropriate to try to stick it onto the manufacturer unless there's good documentation that says you asked for something in a, uh, in a particular way, right? That it'd be a particular um, sort of geometry and within certain ranges of being the correct geometry. So let's talk about cost just a little bit. Uh, we all sort of have this idea that if you can uh, specify tolerances that are a little bit looser, in other words, you don't have to have the tolerances to be in such a tight range, that generally that's going to be something that the manufacturer, whoever that is, it's going to cost them less in order to be able to get into tolerances like that. But there are other factors as well, and that's what this bullet right here is. Um, if you can specify clearly enough what it is that you need in terms of the geometry of the parts that you are making, uh, you very often can get away with uh, having a larger number of suppliers that might be able to meet that need. Um, so even though we might have in mind a lot of times that um, if we have our kind of favorite supplier, one of the reasons they might be our favorite is that they might sort of be able to divine just by sensing what, what they think that we might need out of our, uh, you know, out of our part that we're making, or uh, maybe there's sort of some unofficial types of communication that, that tend to work well between you and your supplier or whatever. Um, that's the kind of thing that tends to make a particular supplier um, one that a, a designer likes to work with. But if that becomes a requirement, like as you as a designer, you need to work with that supplier, that puts your organization in a really hard place because it means that that, that manufacturer can pretty much charge whatever they want if there's no one else that can really read your mind the way that that one supplier uh, manufacturer might be able to. And so, you know, the more clearly we can define what we need, uh, what that does is it makes what we need a little bit more of a kind of a commodity as opposed to a very specialized uh, piece that we can really only get from one place, right? So if you can get it from multiple places, it's going to end up making that part cheaper because it ends up uh, forcing the people who might, or not forcing, but it, it ends up setting up a situation where the people who might be willing to supply that part or assembly, whatever it is for you, they have to compete with others who can also give you the same thing because it's so clearly defined. So not to beat that to death. Um, back to the idea of being able to make our tolerances looser. Um, one of the ways to practically do this as a designer is to have some level of a picture in your mind as to what uh, manufacturing process might be used to create the, the uh, part that you have now specified. And, uh, you know, it's not that you necessarily have to specify that there is a particular you know, technique used to make that part. As a matter of fact, with the uh, GD&T standard that we're going to be using, it's put out by ASME, they pretty much try to de-emphasize that and say, we don't want to tell someone exactly what process they have to use in order to make something. Uh, rather, we want to tell them what the, net, what the net result or what the end outcome needs to be for the part and let the, let the manufacturer choose what the best, uh, you know, what those best tools are to make it. And yet, Whenever you as a designer are familiar enough with the kinds of manufacturing processes are, that are out there, it helps you to intelligently figure out what these tolerance levels are that might uh, you know, save some cost and yet get you a, a pretty high quality part. Um, you know, so kind of understanding what the process is you're shooting for and what that process might be capable or what, what might be easily achievable within that particular manufacturing process, that can help um, you as a designer set what those tolerance levels might be. Okay. Here's just a quick example along those lines. So what this little chart is talking about is sort of the process of taking a shaft and making it the, the diameter that you need. Now, that sounds like it's relatively simple, but it might not be as simple as you think. Because in order to get to uh, some level of tolerance, so we can kind of think about this little chart right here. 
and they kind of the reference point here is what they call a finished turn, meaning that you're kind of expecting that whatever shaft this is, it's being made, it's that it's being made on a lathe. And instead of just doing sort of a rough turn, which basically is, you know, you're not trying to be real careful about what the diameter is. It's like trying to get the shaft to at least roughly the right dimensions. Instead of stopping, stopping there, you go through two more processes, one of which is called a semi-finished turn, which is sort of, you get it to where it's really pretty close, and then finally a finished turn means that you've pretty much gotten the, uh, the shaft to where it's as close to the diameter that you need uh, as you can get with just a plain lathe. And they sort of cite that right here, so these, these kind of tolerance levels right here, they're saying that's roughly about plus or minus one thousandth of an inch is what you can get out of a finished turn. And if we take that as sort of being a 100% cost, this chart gives us at least a rough idea as to relative to that amount of cost, how much cost would it take for you to do other levels of, of turning or of creating a round shaft, okay? So we can go to these additional levels right here. You can grind it after you finish turn it. What that does is it gets rid of things like the little uh, bumps that might exist in the shaft due to what the shape of the tool was as they were doing the finish turn um, on, the, on the lathe. Um, it gets rid of those and gets you to where you can get even closer level of tolerance with that kind of a grinding process that you have there. They cite it to be maybe within plus or minus half a thousandth, right? Or if you need even tighter tolerances than that, there's another level where, you know, it's kind of like grinding. It's called honing. It's, it means you have an even finer stone that you're using to sort of uh, finish off what that finish looks like. And you can get down to the essentially quarter thousandth. But you'll notice that each of these requires more processes and therefore more cost as we look at this, uh, at this chart. Okay, so that's pretty easy to understand, but what I'm going to say is that this is a little bit quantized, right? Like, if you can get it to some level by just getting to a grind, that's going to cost you some amount. Well, in order to get to the level of being honed, you not only have to get to the grinding phase first, and you have to then go to the honing phase. And so it's like, you know, it costs every bit as much as going to the grinding phase, plus this other amount due to this extra process that's now required. That goes the other way too, right? You can go down this way and you can say, well, if all I needed to go to was a rough turn, and really it's the kind of, you know, maybe the type of rough turn that the uh, machinist isn't really necessarily even having to pay very much attention to it and can just, you know, kind of do a pass with the lathe and get that level of tolerance, you know, um, that's going to be a lower cost part. There's even a level below that where it's like, hey, let's, let's say we don't even really even need it made in a lathe. You know, they're citing that at being about plus or minus 30, 30 thousandths, you know, might be saying there, uh, whatever process you use to create something that was sort of roughly round, whether that be extrusion or whether that be um, maybe a forging process or whatever, we're just going to say it's good enough, right? And at some point, there is no more cost to save. In other words, in order to get the part at all, um, maybe it needed to be forged, right? And uh, so, and if, if whatever shape it comes out as after it's been forged is good enough, there's really no more cost savings that you can get to by specifying even looser tolerances relative to that. So that's why I put up here, looser tolerances means less, less expensive up to a point, right? At some point, there is no more other process that you can eliminate. And so, you know, you can't necessarily continue reducing your cost forever by loosening the tolerances more and more, okay? And that's what I'm saying with that bullet right there. Loosening those tolerances past the most basic manufacturing process might not re reduce your cost anymore, okay? In all of these questions, uh, in all of this kind of consideration that we're talking about, it's a good idea to be asking yourself this question. What errors in size and shape uh, would prevent this part or the system or assembly or whatever from properly functioning? And if you always have that in your back of your mind, you can very uh, often get to the point where you can specify maybe the loosest tolerances that are going to make you make your, uh, your system work um, and yet not looser, right? You don't want it to stop working because your tolerances were too loose, right? So that's kind of always in your mind is, What's that level that would make it stop functioning? Okay, well, you know, as we think about that, there's, there's more than one thing going on at one time. And so one of the things we're gonna see in just a few minutes is sometimes you have multiple tolerances that you have to think of all of them in order to know whether or not you've got your, uh, your system to where it is functioning, or it will function properly, even if you're sort of worst case scenario in the range of all your tolerances. Before we get to that, let me get to a number of terms that we might use when we talk about tolerancing, okay? And I'm going to do this in the context of sort of a rough example here. And the, the one I'm going to look at, uh, at least at first here, when we're talking about different kind of terms for talking about sizes or dimensions, I'm going to do that with respect to this example of a stainless steel pipe. Okay? And uh, with this particular stainless steel pipe, the manufacturer of the pipe uh, decided to use this ASTM A312 standard to talk about the dimensioning of the pipe. Okay, sometimes there's some um, 
flexibility on, on how exactly you can talk about this, but this is what this manufacturer decided to do. Um, over here where it says iron pipe size, that's a, uh, a common term in industry. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a new term um, that I honestly don't remember what it is, off, but th this is a, a, a name of a type of, uh, of sizing of a pipe called iron pipe size. And what I want to point out here is this is kind of interesting. If this is a three quarter inch stainless steel pipe, we've got this three quarter listed right here. And yet we look at these sizes, none of the things that are cited here, the outside diameter, the inside diameter, the wall thickness, none of them are three quarters of an inch, even though it's named three quarters of an inch. And so I'm going to try to kind of show this a little bit here. Let's say this is the real piece. We have an actual piece of pipe and we're looking at the cross section of it. And what I want to point out here is that that means that roughly the outside diameter should be 1.05 if this is a three quarter inch pipe and roughly the inside diameter should be 0.824, right? And again, none of those are three quarters of an inch, which means that we need a different name for maybe that uh, three quarters of an inch. And the good news is it does sort of have a name. It's called the nominal size or, you know, there's other instances where this might be like more of a nominal dimension. But the nominal size is what we use when we sort of speak of it in common terms, right? You're just, you're just talking about it with someone else. You say, okay, get me that three quarter inch pipe over there. It doesn't mean any dimension on it's necessarily three quarters of an inch. It just means that's how you name it. And that's how you talk about it. Okay. And in this particular case, that size of three quarters of an inch is significantly smaller, even than the inside uh, dimension of that pipe. These are kind of roughly to scale. They're not necessarily exactly to scale. Okay. Well, here's the other part that's a little bit tricky here. Um, not only is this pipe, you know, these dimensions, I should say it this way, these dimensions that are listed for this pipe, it doesn't mean that the pipe you get are necessarily going to be exactly at those dimensions, okay? Um, there's, for these pipes, there are some acceptable deviations away from the, uh, the listed values there that uh, are sort of specified for these pipes. And this is a three-quarter inch pipe, meaning that we're in this row right here of this table. And what this is telling us is that the actual size of the pipe might be as much as 1 64th of an inch greater, bigger than uh, kind of the, the size that's listed in the table, or it might be as much as 1 32nd of an inch less than the size that's listed in the table, okay? And so what do we call this size that's listed in the table? Okay, the good news is we actually do have a name for that, okay? Let's say that for our example that we're doing right here, um, let's say that we're sort of to the smaller end relative to what the name, or kind of what the, uh, this 1.05 dimension is right here which means that that 1.05 dimension might be as big as something like that, okay? Well, that green circle that I just put on right there, assuming that this example of a pipe is now smaller than that green circle, um, this is what we call the basic size or dimension. It means this is sort of the one that we use to um, kind of specify the kind of the uh, point from which we would measure tolerances, right? It's sort of the, what we list as where we start, and then we can measure tolerances relative to that value. So if this one, this particular example, the pipe that we actually have in practice is smaller than the basic size, this is what it would look like, right? So then what do we call the size that we actually have with our sample of pipe? Well, um, not surprisingly, we might call that the actual size. So if I was able to grab a, a measurement tool and measure the outside diameter of the actual gray pipe, we would call that the actual size or dimension, right, of the, of the part. So when we're talking about sizes, uh, we're sort of, we've got this number of different ways that we can talk about it. Nominal is how we name it. Basic is sort of the, uh, the, where we start from before we start applying things like tolerances. And then you might have a, uh, you know, the pipe that you actually have that you're looking at might exist in some other size, bigger or smaller relative to the basic size. And this example that I'm showing right here, it's a little bit smaller. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, that value could be as low as 1.019 inch. Once you do that little bit of math right there. It could be as low as 1.019 inch and you would still not have any sort of a complaint to lodge with the manufacturer of the pipe because the manufacturer of the pipe says, I'm going to make it, I'm going to try to make it that size, but my tolerances are anywhere from plus 164th of an inch to minus 132nd of an inch. And so anything, uh, as long as you're not lower than 1.019, then it means that you have no gripe with the manufacturer of this pipe. So those are some examples of uh, terms that we use with respect to sizing things. Okay. Now let's look at some other terms here. Um, when we do this, a lot of times tolerances specify a range over which uh, the value can be, and it means that from a, from a uh, designer or a manufacturer standpoint, um, it represents the range where you're going to say that it was good enough, right? You were in the range that was okay, that you can tolerate, we'll say, right? That's kind of where this word tolerances comes from, okay? So with this, uh, I'll take the same example we did before, and I'll do it for kind of two different sizes there. We've got a three-quarter inch uh, 
nominal size as well as a two inch nominal size. And I want to show you here the, the limits then means that you take the basic size that we have for either one of those cases, right? For the three quarter inch we've got right there, two inch we've got down here at 2.375. And then you apply the tolerances that are listed for these. And what I'm going to show you here is that sometimes you have different tolerances. Um, you know, if you have like maybe a family of parts like we do for this pipe, uh, those tolerances a lot of times scale with the overall size of the thing. That's kind of another point I'm just going to touch on along the way. But either of these cases, you can figure out what the limits are um, where it's basically those are the acceptable limits of how the thing is made. So that's that term. When you talk about a tolerance, if you use this idea of a tolerance without any kind of a modifier, usually what you're meaning is that it's the difference between the upper and lower limits. It's like how much total uh, range through which it can vary um, and, uh, and still be okay. So there's two different uh, values for that for this example. Um, when we've got our three-quarter inch pipe, the tolerance, the total tolerance is going to be three sixty-fourths of an inch, whereas for the two-inch pipe, we're at one sixteenth of an inch. And again, the smaller one has a tighter tolerance than the bigger one. Okay, so that's what we mean by tolerance. Although you might notice here, this says tolerances. Um, that term gets used that way too, where it talks about kind of your your uh, how much more or how much less. Um, and there actually is a name for that as well. That's called a bilateral tolerance, right? It means that you can have variation both directions relative to the basic size, okay? And so that happens a couple of different ways in this example, right? We have uh, 2.375, and an acceptable way to say this, maybe on a machine drawing or something, would be to say the basic size and then use a symbol like this, plus or minus, or sometimes they do it with a plus slash minus, um, 1 32nd of an inch. And I should mention this as well, when you're doing machine drawings, it is a very common thing for the machine drawing to have one statement somewhere that specifies the units that that machine drawing is using throughout the whole thing um, and not necessarily label units on each and every place that there is a label for a dimension, right? A more common way to do it is to put an overall note somewhere and then everywhere on the, on the drawing you would just put a number and have the reader of the drawing refer to the note that said what the dimensions were, okay? So this is one way to do a bilateral tolerance or to specify a bilateral tolerance. If you have a bilateral tolerance where you don't have symmetry around the basic size, right? Here we have symmetry because it's the same amount higher, same amount lower that's acceptable relative to the basic size. If you don't have that kind of symmetry, what you would typically do is label it something like this, where you put the basic size and then you put how much more it can go or how much less it can go. And I, I did this example with these fractional inches to let you know that that's, um, you, you can do it that way. Um, probably more often than uh, putting in fractional numbers of inches, um, it's probably a more common thing to see this done with decimals in, as opposed to fractions. But I, I decided to show it because uh, that way you, you can see that that's one acceptable way of showing what these would be. Okay. Um, as opposed to a bilateral tolerance, another way of specifying, specifying um, kind of the limits um, of what the, the size could be of something is with what, what's called a unilateral tolerance. The unilateral tolerance, what you do is you take one end of the range of limits and you set that as your basic size and then you just specify uh, what your tolerance is just in one direction relative to that one basic size. So here's an example, uh, and I'll mention here that uh, you can convert from being a bilateral tolerance to being a unilateral tolerance or vice versa. You can go either direction from that. If we convert this case up here into unilateral tolerances, what you'll see happens, you know, they'll do it one way for the three-quarter inch where essentially I'm setting the basic size to be the lower end of the range, right? So I'm saying there's zero amount of deviation allowed on the lower end of their range, right? You're not allowed to go any less than whatever the basic size is. And you see there, that means that the lower limit ends up being the same as the lower limit that I had when I, with my bilateral tolerance that I had specified before, specified before. And the upper end of the range is also the same, right? Um, it ends up being the same either way, and you see that the entire amount of tolerance is just applied to just one of those limits. Um, there's different standards and different kind of cases where you might want to use either a unilateral tolerance versus a bilateral tolerance. Um, I'll mention this real quick, that when you're a, a maker of something, a, a machinist, let's say, um, very often um, you, what you want to do if someone gives you a unilateral tolerance, you know, it means that you're probably not going to be shooting for the basic size. Let's take a, a really specific example again of the machinist who's on a lathe producing a, a shaft, okay? So if you're producing a shaft and someone says, hey, you know, the basic size needs to be one inch, right? So if you're the machinist, if it's one inch and then a unilateral tolerance that says you can go minus zero relative to that one inch, but you can go plus a thousandth, right? Or let's say 10 thousandths. Let's say minus zero, but plus 10 thousandths is okay. As the machinist, if you immediately try to go to that 1.000 inch, right? You go to that lower end of that range. Well, if you make a mistake 
and you take too much material off, you can't add material back on. You might have to scrap that whole part. So very often what a machinist will do is they might, if they're given a unilateral tolerance, they might sort of mentally think, or, or maybe even more than mentally, they might even write it down and sort of figure out what a bilateral tolerance is. And they might shoot for somewhere nearer the middle of the range as opposed to shooting for one end or the other of the range. And that way, um, when they shoot more for the middle, it's more likely that they'll land in, in some kind of a spot in between the two ends of the range that uh, is acceptable and it means that they won't have to rework the part. Okay. Um, the other way that I can say this, I did this for the two inch example, you can set that basic size at the upper end of the range and then just specify only a uh, subtractive uh, tolerance there. So, and you can see um, with, uh, with this example, you end up at the same limits, um, whether you do it as a bilateral tolerance or as a unilateral tolerance. All right, so here's a kind of a special case that we need to think about a little bit, but it's one that happens a lot. And so we're, we have a few special terms for this. Very often, uh, we, we need to fit parts together such that there's maybe a hole and then a piece that fits into the hole. And the most common way of seeing that is with cylindrical hole and a cylindrical pin or shaft or something that goes into the hole or bolt or anything like that. Um, now, these terms, even though they're kind of primarily used for those kind of cylindrical mates, um, these terms are sometimes used in other cases as well. Like you could have a square hole with a square peg going in it, and you might see people still use at least the generalized form of these terms. Uh, that we're about to go over. The first of which is clearance. Okay, When you have parts that mate such that the size of a hole um, is bigger, you know, the hole in one feature is, uh, is bigger than the feature that's going to go into it. So you have one part that has a hole, you have a feature on another, another part that needs to insert into the hole. Um, if the hole is larger than the feature, it means that there's going to be clearance between those two pieces. Okay, So I have a little kind of diagram here. It might be easy to see, easy to see or it might not be so easy to see. But you'll notice here that uh, it looks like this upper piece, this upper round piece up here, is a little bit smaller than the hole, which means that you're going to have some clearance as you put this piece in there. It means you won't have to try to force it in. It means it'll essentially just slip in there. And some, in some cases, that's the kind of interface that you want to have happen between um, the part that is inserted and between the, the piece that it's inserted into. Okay? Um, on the other end of that, you might have another case where you have a piece that's a little bit bigger than the hole that you're trying to insert it into. Right? And in that case, you have a case that's called interference. Right? It means that it's not going to be easy just to slide that piece right into that hole. But that's sometimes something you want as well, because that's one way to install um, maybe the peg in the hole, or maybe the piece goes, maybe it's like a hub that goes on a shaft. But it's one way that you can put it on there and have it stay put. Right? And sometimes that's what we want to do, and uh, have there be an assembly process where you, you know, take some force maybe to stick this uh, piece into the other piece, and then the resulting friction due to the fact that you've had to sort of elastically deform those two parts, the resulting force and then the resulting friction between those two parts can end up mating them and keeping them put one relative to the other. So uh, sometimes that's what we want to do, and sometimes we want some clearance. Right? So either of those could be ways that we would want pieces to go together. But either way, uh, this represents a type of installation where you're probably going to need some relatively close tolerances to make it behave like you want to. Okay, And so there's some specialized um, sort of thinking about this and some specialized terms and methods about how to achieve um, these kinds of mates. Okay, um, Real quick before I leave this point, you can specify clearance or interference as either the difference in diameters or the difference in radii. Right? If you specify a difference in diameters, then that's called diametral clearance or interference. All right, depending on which case you, you've got. If you specify a difference in radius values, that's called radial clearance or interference. Okay? Um, an allowance is something that essentially tells you either the minimum amount of clearance that you need. Right? In other words, you, know, um, you, you need a certain minimum amount of clearance between the two parts or the maximum interference for these mated parts. So basically, this is a term that tells you um, kind of <laughs> how close do you need to be to what you were trying to get. If you have too much interference, then what that does is it's going to make your, uh, it's going to make the stress in the parts might end up making it too high. That's the kind of the biggest consequence that usually happens if you have too much interference between two parts. Whereas if you have, uh, you know, sort of too little clearance, you might have parts that are too tight, right? Um, you can also have too much clearance, right? Where you you uh, end up having things that are too loose relative to each other, where it doesn't locate the two parts relative to each other in a in a precise enough way. So, anyway, use allowance to set those kind of considerations. Um, whereas with a fit, right? A fit is is specified as the amount of clearance or interference between mating parts. Okay. So um, there's different ways that we can specify these fits. 
Um, and uh, what I want to show you just kind of briefly, even though I've got other examples and stuff that are out there that uh, I would encourage you to, to check out if you want to go navigate. Um, I think I'm, there's going to be some links uh, in the description here on how to get to the videos that I'm referencing here. But um, this is sort of a big area of how do you actually go about specifying a fit, right? Um, and so, again, I'll, I'll kind of point you to some of those other videos I've got out there. But just in really brief um, amount of time right here, let me talk about um, some general ideas with respect to this happening. This is something that, that this is the type of specification that a designer is going to need to make often enough that there are some sort of big categories that can be used to specify what these fits might be uh, for this case of having sort of cylindrical parts mating with each other. Okay, and it goes again all the way from having a case of clearance to a case of interference. But what you see here in this table is a number of different kinds of um, you know, and what I like about them is they sort of have a, a name, loose running fit, free running fit, all the way down to medium drive fit or force fit. They've got these different names and then they've got a little sort of qualitative description of what um, those might be good for. And then to the side, there's this standard that exists um, that allows us to, you know, a designer may not be immediately uh, familiar with exactly what kind of clearances or interferences are going to be needed to create a scenario that you get one of these kinds of um, you know, maybe qualitative descriptions as far as the net result. And so um, what the designer might do is look at something like this and say, man, I, I want it to be, you know, maybe I want it to have really accurate location, but I want the two parts to be able to rotate relative to each other, but I don't really need super high speeds where they rotate relative to each other. It's more important for me to get there to be accurate location of one piece relative to the other. So the designer has that in mind for what he needs out of a particular interface between two parts. The designer can look at a table like this and say, oh, okay, I need a, uh, this is specified as an H8F7. So let me talk about that for just a little bit. What you're doing with this is you're actually, um, what you're doing is you're actually specifying two different things, as you might expect with a little one specification then another one with a little slash in between. What you're doing in all these cases, and I'll, I'll look at that one we just talked about, um, the first pair of information, H8, refers to information that has to do with the whole. All right. The H talks about how much deviation you are going to intentionally apply relative to the basic size. The basic size being kind of what you expected the, the value is going to be listed on the machine drawing. Right. H says how much are you going to try to try to make that deviate relative to that value. Okay. And if you look down here, all these different letters are what specify these. And what you're saying with an H8 is you're saying I'm not going to try to put any deviation. Right. These are all zero right here. I'm not going to try to put any deviation relative to what I'm saying the value is on the sheet, okay? Like, or kind of the the this the size that we use as the basic size. I'm not going to try to make it deviate at all. And then where it says eight right here, that's a tolerance grade. So you look in a table like this, and it says that for a particular shaft size, right? These kind of give you these ranges of different sizes of shaft. Which, by the way, uh, both of these tables here, um, I both I used the one that was in millimeters. There are other versions of these tables that are in inch. But anyway, for different uh, sizes of the shaft, um, what this says is that, you know, if we're at an IT8 tolerance grade, um, and let's say that we're at a 10 millimeter shaft, well, that might be, an, uh, let's say we're at a 15 millimeter shaft, that way we're on this line right here. It says that we can do a tolerance of 0 0.027, right? And I'm going to leave out kind of the details of how that tolerance actually gets applied, but um, I will say it does end up being applied as a unilateral tolerance, so I'll just mention that. But again, I've got another uh, example out there that I do a more detailed example of this. Okay, um, so the again the letter is how much you're intentionally up or downsizing the hole or the shaft relative to what the basic size is, and then the number tells you how much plus or minus you're allowed off of what you're intentionally de you know off of that amount that you intentionally deviated. So where we go to the F7, right? That's this other one right here. Um, what that says is that you're going to deviate um, on the shaft, okay? And let's say again, we've got a 15 millimeter, so we'd be in this range right here. We've got an F. What this says is that for a 15 millimeter size shaft, you would intentionally downsize that shaft by 0 0.016 millimeters, okay? Um, and then from there, you're allowed a tolerance grade of seven, meaning you can go, um, you know, again, it's another unilateral tolerance, but at that 15 millimeter basic size that I'm sort of, you know, mentally thinking through, um, it means that that tolerance is now going to be 0 0.018. The power of doing it in this way is that um, as you decrease the amount of size of your basic size, 
your tolerances in order to get the same kind of fit or the same sort of result, your tolerances can scale with that value. So if you decrease the size, it means you got to de decrease those tolerances. You got to make it more accurate. If you increase the size, then you typically can increase the tolerances and you might not need to make it quite as accurate. And this allows you to kind of get the kind of fit that you want um, without necessarily having to know a lot about it as the designer. Probably spent more time on that than I meant to, but again, I would, uh, I would reference you back to uh, the uh, other examples that I have posted out there and you can find the, the links to those um, in the description of this video. All right, so let's think about this a little bit. As a designer, you get to choose which dimensions you, you write on the page that you're going to submit to a manufacturer and say, hey, I want this made, right? So you have this machine drawing you're going to submit to a manufacturer. You get to decide what dimensions you put on that page. And so the first example that I'm going to talk through here is one that uh, we got to be careful with, and it's this one over here, okay? One argument could be, well, I want to put as many dimensions on my drawing as I possibly can, and that way the, pe the person who's going to be making this part will have all the reference information that they want. They'll know exactly how to make, how big to make each one of the features. This is actually not a good idea to do, okay? That's called, if you do that, then what it does is it, it, it's called over-constraining the part. And when you do this, it causes ambiguity, and I'm going to show you why. Let's say that with this example that I just showed right here, let's say that you did this and then you put a universal uh, note on your drawing, that you did this with a plus or minus one unit of, um, of tolerance, right? So let's just say, let's say you say a plus or minus one, okay? Now let's take a, uh, a what if. What if you did this, one possibility is that the 50 here is no longer 50, it's instead 51. This 50 right here is no longer 50, it's 51. Okay, let's just say that if those were both 51, you would be within tolerance still. Okay, well, let's say this one's no longer 150, let's say this one is 149. You're still in tolerance, right? Like everything, you know, if this is plus or minus one unit, you can think of it maybe as millimeters or something like that, plus or minus one unit, everything here is still in tolerance. Okay. Um, well, now let's look at, you know, the 50 that we have over here. We now have enough information to kind of figure out if this one really did turn out 51 and this one really did turn out 51 and this one turned out 149, what does this have to be? What does that 50 at the end have to be? Okay. Well, this one, if this is 51, 51, and 149, um, you know, that means that you've got 102 along with that 149, right? And that means you're basically off by three. So this would be like a 47. Well, that would not be okay as far as a tolerance goes. This would be out of tolerance, right? Even though the other ones were in tolerance, okay? Well, and, and now think about, you know, that means that this, this one right here would be 102, Okay, well, you know, 102 uh, maybe is also out of tolerance, right? You think of 102, we said down here it needed to be plus or minus one, and now you're these two units out of tolerance up there. So I may not have done this in exactly the right way or kind of in a, as clear a way as possible. My point with it, though, is if you apply a uh, tolerance like this, a plus or minus one, to all these dimensions and it is over-constrained, it makes it basically impossible for the person making it to know which of those which of those tolerances you thought were most important right like which ones are the most important for me to get within spec and and uh, you know it can end up leading to this level of ambiguity um, because of the conflicts that arise once you try to think about how to put those tolerances on there okay so the first point that I'm going to make there is don't over constrain your parts when you're putting your uh, dimensions on it. Only put just enough dimensions on there in order to fully specify where everything is, but don't put more on. Okay. Now, once you've decided, well, I'm only going to put on enough to fully specify my part, the next question is, how do you choose which dimensions you should apply your tolerances to? I'm going to show you these four cases right here. These four cases um, are... Uh, they should be the same part. If we could make things absolutely perfectly, all four of these would end up being the same part. And yet, these mean four different things to a machinist or a, another manufacturer who might be trying to make this part. Okay, and let's let's look at why. Okay, if uh, let's take it, let's take part A and think about what if um, we had this part, you know, made according to part A right up here. And um, okay, over there, I'm gonna. I popped it up a little bit earlier, but I'll go ahead and mention it. The most sensitive dimension should be specified most directly, okay? Let me kind of talk through that just a little bit. With this part, what if it was really important that the overall length of this thing 
be exactly 150 millimeters, let's say, if these are millimeters. Okay, well, you maybe didn't apply your, uh, your tolerances the way you might, may, might have been best, right? It may not be applied the way it would have been best um, because what you end up with is a plus or minus three millimeters for the overall length because you, you're on one end of the possibility of what could happen is that all three of these could be 51 and this whole thing's width could be 153, right? If each one of these was plus one, you might end up being at 153 length. Well, what if, you know, each of these was minus one? So, you know, you'd end up with 49 plus 49 plus 49, right? Instead of it being 150, now it'd be 147, right? So you'd end up with basically plus or minus, you know, you could go to plus three or minus three. So a total uh, range of six millimeters of tolerance that ends up stacking up by specifying it in that way, right? So if you needed that dimension to be really accurate, you're not getting it, okay? So you might say, well, the rest of the three here um, do a better job of like controlling that width dimension. Well, then let's take another example. What if it's really important that the spacing between the two holes in this part is really accurate? That's definitely something that could arise where you need that spacing to be very, very precise. Maybe this, maybe you have another piece that has two pins and those two pins need to line up with the two holes, in which case that spacing needs to be very precise and very accurate. Well, if that's the case, you certainly wouldn't want to do this example down here, right? And the reason you wouldn't want to do this example down here is that the width of the whole thing is plus or minus one. So let's say you, you, uh, you were at the upper end of the range of possibility there. So you ended up with 151 overall width, okay? And then let's say each of these two dimensions was at the minimum of what it could possibly be, right? So 49 and 49. What that does is it means that you're now three millimeters off with the spacing of the two holes. And so by not kind of directly putting that, um, you know, that dimension with its tolerances right there, you've now come up with this hole that's, you know, it's, uh, these two holes are spaced plus or minus three millimeters from each other, which may be more than you wanted, right? Um, so up here gives you a, an alternative to that. And, um, you know, it, it now directly specifies the width between those two holes. Um, one of the things that you'll see happen here, though, is that the amount of distance from this hole, right, this, this length right here, what's the tolerance left on that? Well, you end up with um, one here plus one here plus one here. So you end up with some level of tolerance that happens from this hole to this edge that that ends up at three um, uh, millimeters. All right, whereas this other one down here, you know, directly specifies all relative to one um, edge over here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and say, if I don't have another reason why I'm specifying these dimensions in a particular way, I like this way of doing it, even though with option D here, if you think about the, uh, you know, the tolerance now between these two holes, you have plus or minus one for this relative to the left edge and plus or minus one for this hole relative to the left edge, which means that you've got plus or minus two uh, for these two relative to each other, right? So I wouldn't do this method if I needed that accurate spacing between these two holes. I'd rather do this method up here if I need the accurate spacing between the two holes. But let me show you on this next slide why it is that I really, you know, if I don't have some other thing I'm shooting for, um, I very much like option D for how I would specify uh, the dimensioning of a part, okay? And it has to do with this term called tolerance stack up, okay? Um, with any one of these uh, cases, we had tolerances stacking up somewhere. In the first case, in other words, the tolerances sort of all chained together in order to make a, a particular dimension that had a large amount of tolerance, which is you know typically not as good as having smaller tolerances, right? It's generally more desirable if you, all of the things being equal to uh, to have tighter tolerances. So in this case, we saw that it stacked up for that overall length dimension, right? That was where we ended up with plus or minus three uh, millimeters for what that overall length dimension would be. With this one, we saw just a second ago, it was plus or minus three for that dimension. That's where the tolerances tended to stack up, right? It was right there. It ended up being plus or minus three over there. In this case down here, I don't remember if I talked about it directly, but we wound up with a plus or minus three on this dimension right here. So in all three of these cases, um, our overall stack up was plus or minus three, right? Plus or minus three here, plus or minus three as far as the tolerance um, that existed for any one of these examples. Well, let's look at this one now. We dimensioned all of these relative to a common, we call it a baseline, right? Dimensioned all these relative to that common baseline. And what you'll notice here is that any um, sort of pair of dimensions, right? So like right here, um, of course, the direct ones, we already know those are each plus or minus one, right? But now let's take other possibilities. What about right here? Okay. Well, if you think about that, 
you've got plus or minus one relative to this baseline to get to this end, and you've got another plus or minus one, which means that here you would have plus or minus two, right? Um, what about right here? For that one right there, you would have plus or minus one for this hole, plus or minus one for this hole, and you'd have plus or minus two for that dimension right there, okay? What about this over here? Also, plus or minus two, because you'd have the 150 to one of those edges plus the 100 to this other edge, you'd have plus or minus two for that one. Okay, and we could take any combination um, of these, and we'd figure out that there was there by doing this common baseline like this, nowhere is it more um, of a tolerance that we end up with than plus or minus two. And so our worst case location, we were able to control it to a smaller level of tolerance, um, essentially by you know doing this baseline. Now, I'm not saying you always want to do baseline. Baseline is generally a way to reduce the maximum possible error that you could have. But sometimes, like let's say, they, again, we'll go back to this concept of what if the spacing between the holes is really something that was critical, that you needed that to be accurate. Well, it could be that you need that, and yet, let's say that for your particular part, you don't really care what as much, or maybe you don't care at all, what the spacing is from um, the hole to one of these edges. Maybe there's no reason why you need to care about that. Well, in that case, it's okay to let your tolerances stack up at that location, okay? So, um, hopefully, you know, this is clear enough as far as how you could control where your tolerances stack up. And uh, by doing it this with this baseline, it ends up typically reducing whatever your overall max uh, tolerance is going to be. But then by, uh, you know, kind of smartly applying where you would put your tolerances, you can more directly control the, uh, the dimensions that might matter to you. And no one's going to know that better than you as the designer, right? So that's one of those things that um, is more of a reason that I mentioned this right at the beginning, but it's got to be the designer that is aware of what all the purposes are of this part so that they know where it's okay to let these tolerances stack up or if there's kind of nowhere that it's okay to let the tolerances stack up then a lot of times your best strategy um, is to try to do more of a baseline uh, type of a dimensioning system to try to reduce whatever your worst case scenario is for tolerances. All right, um, let's talk about all of what we've been doing so far has been with respect to the idea of traditional tolerancing. And um, one of the things that's you know, sometimes this is actually called coordinate system uh, tolerant, tolerancing. Okay, this is the traditional coordinate dimensioning system. Um, one of the downsides of this is that there are certain characteristics of the part that you as a designer think you've drawn it to where it's clear what you want, and yet when you get in the real world, there are things that uh, occur with different kinds of materials or the way things are made, and you can end up having problems occur um, with how the thing is made. And um, you might not have specified enough on your drawing to say that those things were unacceptable. So here's one example. Let's say you, you want this part. It's got this one inch diameter. It's, I don't know if it's inches or millimeters. It doesn't necessarily matter a whole lot. Let's say they're inches for this example. So you've got this one inch diameter hole, space six inches up from the bottom. There's an eight inch overall height, two inches over from one side, four inches from the other side. And then down here, the uh, tolerance is set all with one note, which by the way, that's not an uncommon way to do this on a machine drawing, to set your tolerances sort of all in one spot. Um, here it says the thickness of this thing should be two inches. And so you might think this is completely clear exactly what I want out of this part. And yet it might not be. Okay. So let's say you do this, you send it off to the manufacturer and the manufacturer sends you back a part that looks something like this. Now, in case you're having trouble seeing what this looks like, um, what you're seeing is that this edge right here winds up not actually being straight. This edge down here ends up being sort of wavy. Right? The whole thing seems like it's sort of skewed in, a, in kind of a bent fashion. The hole may not be drilled perpendicularly to the surface. Right? And maybe it's got this other dimension over here that you know, it's you know, a little bit curvy. Well, here's the thing. There is no way to make a part where some of these characteristics might you know, not show up. Now, you might be the kind of thing where you would need really specialized equipment. Like it might be made so well that no one could detect that it was wrong a little bit. Right? Um, and in that case, then you as, a, as the designer probably wouldn't notice that there was something wrong with it. But from a manufacturing standpoint, they don't know what level of acceptability there is on these kinds of parameters. How flat does this surface need to be? Um, how perpendicular does this hole need to be relative to the surface? And that kind of thing. So they make it and they take this thing and they say, look, I built that part exactly how you told me to on that drawing. Because you didn't tell me how, how perpendicular these things need to be or how flat a certain surface needs to be. So as far as the explicit uh, requirements that you set forth as a designer, they have been met on this uh, produced part. And yet it might, as you can see here, um, it might not be flat enough or square enough or anything like that to where um, you as the designer will say that that's acceptable for the purpose of the part uh, might be playing. Okay, So 
All this to kind of motivate this idea that something better than just the traditional system might uh, might be needed. Now, here's the thing. For years, even before the existence of GD&T standards, um, which we'll talk about those a little bit more in just a second, uh, designers have always sort of put notes on drawings to try to say, hey, this needs to be at least this flat, or this needs to be uh, perpendicular within some range, or that, like that. It's not like that's necessarily completely new, but what we have with these GD&T standards are much more, um, I guess, standardized way of saying those kinds of things, as well as a structure of thought about the kinds of things that you should be thinking about to fully specify um, all the details with respect to the geometry of a part. And so that's one of the things I'm trying to sort of motivate here is this idea that we're trying to reduce the number of implicit assumptions that you as a designer think you're giving to the manufacturer. Um, you know, it, we're trying to make more of the things that could go be different about a part. We're trying to make them explicit in terms of what are the limits of acceptability um, with respect to some of these other parameters such as parallelism or perpendicularity or that kind of thing. Um, all right. So hopefully that kind of makes sense here. So there are four fundamentals of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. So this is the system that we uh, kind of developed in, uh, in engineering to try to deal with these kinds of issues. And these are the four fundamentals, size, location, orientation, and form. I'm going to kind of go through these a little bit. The first one, though, I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip that one. Okay. So size, uh, I won't skip it completely. Size is what you get by sort of figuring out how wide it is across a couple of opposing points. Okay. We'll talk about that more just a little bit. That has always, by the way, the size thing, that has always been a part of any dimensioning of things. You, you tend to always need to know what the sizes are of things. So, you know, there's, there's nothing new about having to specify size, and yet it is one of the four big fundamentals of what you need to specify using geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Okay, so here are some ones that might not have always been part of people's thought process whenever they were dimensioning things with the old kind of traditional coordinate dimensioning system. Okay, one of them is called location. Although even this one is, is very often had to be a part of it, but there are some things that, you know, we're going to explicitly put down, like position, right? How far is it in this example? How far is it from one edge to the other edge right there? It's not a feature of size, as we'll get to in just a second, but it's, it's where is this thing located? Um, but other things like concentricity, right? Are two things, two uh, cylinders or circles concentric with one another? Or symmetry. You know, let's say you have a plane of symmetry that you want to specify for your part. How symmetric do two things need to be across that plane or across a, an axis of symmetry? That kind of thing. So these are issues of location that we're going to deal with with our geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Orientation, right? So this very often has to do with angularity of things. And as a matter of fact, that's one of them that's called angularity, right? It's do you have two things that are at the proper angle relative to each other? Or do you have two things that are supposed to be perpendicular? Are they really perpendicular? Or two things that are supposed to be parallel. Are they really parallel? And, and can we specify some range through which, you know, if they're not perfectly parallel, what level of parallelity or, or perpendicularity, right, parallelism or perpendicularity, what level of that is acceptable? Um, you know, if it's not going to be perfect, you know, how close to perfect does it need to be? Okay. Um, another one is uh, form, right? This has to do with sort of the outer shape of something. And this is actually maybe one of the things that makes um, real geometric dimensioning and tolerancing the hardest is that no surface that we ever produce is exactly the surface shape that we wanted. So if we're trying to make a cylinder, nothing we actually produce in real life ever ever becomes a perfectly true cylinder, right? Or if we want a plane, nothing we make in real life is actually truly a plane, right? Now we can get close, we can, we can make it to where um, it looks like a plane, it seems like a plane, but there's always like you know, even if you get down to the microscopic, like molecular or atomic level, there's going to be some roughness to the surface. And so how can you say that it's going to really be a plane, even if you got it otherwise perfectly planar, right? So this is one of the trickiest things that has to go into geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. But we have some names for some different ways that we can specify how close we are in form. Things like straightness, flatness, circularity, or cylindricity, right? Those are some interesting terms there, okay? Like how close we are to a cylinder, how close we are to a circle, how close we are to being perfectly flat how perfectly straight we are in terms of a line, okay? Well, I promised this, so um, I mentioned features of size here just a second ago. So this, and I mentioned that it means that you have measurability across opposing points, okay? One good way of thinking about this is that it's whatever you can measure with the head end of a caliper, right? You can do that to the inside, right? This is two opposing points of an inside circle, although it doesn't have to be a circle, but you know, you have two inside points and you can measure that distance one relative to the other, or you have two outer points and you can measure what that distance is one relative to the other using the head of a caliper. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to say about these, these are the easiest type for us to inspect, generally speaking, right? Um, a caliper is really good at getting pretty accurate information about how far it is across opposing points. 
okay? Um, so this is, it's good from that standpoint. Um, you might notice here that I haven't mentioned the other end of this caliper, which is another way that you can make a measurement, right? Um, you can kind of measure how deep a hole is or how far it is from one feature to another. Like if I go back to my last slide right here, you could use that end of the caliper to, to measure maybe a, a dimension like this on like the position of, um, of where this vertical is relative to this outer edge. You can measure that. Um, it's a little bit more difficult than with the, uh, the head end of the caliper to get that kind of information. Um, but it's still, you know, it's possible to do with that end. And yet, we don't call that a feature of size. If it's something that you have to measure that way, it's not officially a feature of size, okay? So, um, and there are other features too that, that uh, I guess still need to be specified, and yet we wouldn't call them features of size because they can't be measured across opposing points, whether those be internal or external points. The other thing I'm going to say about this is that uh, there, uh, this is generally the only kind of dimension that you would put on a drawing where it's acceptable just to put it directly as a plus minus, either like the plus minus symbol like we've talked about um, in the previous slides or the kind of the more bilateral technique, right? Plus XX, you know, minus XXX, you know, um, where you have that asymmetric bilateral tolerancing. Okay, so anyway, but this is with these features of size, this, these are the only kind where it's okay to have that direct plus or minus um, technique of tolerancing. All right, so let's get into um, some of the kind of look and feel of what we mean by geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, okay? On the, the last couple of slides, we were talking about, again, size, location, orientation, and form. And you see those actually, some of those terms um, are actually listed here, right? Form, orientation, but we've got some other ones as well. You'll notice that size is actually left off of this. And that the reason why is that typically sizes are simple enough that we don't necessarily need a big system for us to define what we mean by a feature of size. So we don't have size in this table. We have the other ones, though, as well as some other, um, you know, sort of categories that we're going to have to think about with respect to uh, some of these features. My goal is not to actually kind of present this entire table and what everything means. My goal is to just show you that one of the things we're going to get out of doing geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is an entire system of symbols that we can use to describe uh, some of these characteristics that we are going to need to control, right? straightness, flatness, circularity, cylindricity, angularity, perpendicularity, parallelism, position, concentricity, symmetry, right? As well as these other ones, these profile ones up here or run out is particularly important when you're dealing with like parts that are going to be circular parts that rotate. Run out is kind of like whether or not the cylinder that's, that, that defines that shaft um, is sort of true. Um, and so run out is, uh, is another factor that we have here. So anyway, what you do with all these symbols is you put them into something that's called a feature control frame. And again, I'm not necessarily trying to get you to understand all of this just yet, but I figure it's a good idea to mention that uh, these are the kinds of characteristics that we're trying to control, and the feature control frame gives us a structure where this is going to be put onto the drawings in kind of the same way every time, right? Um, and we'll learn how to read these feature control frames. Um, most of them essentially begin with this uh, geometric control symbol, which is what we're talking about over here, and it lets you know what you're trying to control in that feature control frame, okay? Uh, before I leave here, I'm just going to mention a couple of words that are also on here. One of them is a datum, right? And so that is one of the things that we're trying to control. And then another one is a tolerance. And really what that's setting up is something that's called a tolerance zone. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in just a minute. So, but again, I'm not trying to get you to kind of fully understand what this feature control frame does yet at this point. We'll leave that for, for subsequent lectures. But I want you to see that this is the kind of thing that we're going to learn how to both um, you know, read and understand if it's on someone else's drawing, but also how you would want to go about specifying your own drawing to make sure that your part that you're designing is made with the kind of tolerances that you need. Okay, so uh, back to this big idea that I think maybe the maybe this is the biggest idea of what I'm trying to say with this whole thing is that with this, this GD&T system, it improves our ability to communicate with one another about what we want out of our parts or about what we're required to do if you're on the manufacturer side, um, you know, it allows you this good language we can use to communicate that, and by doing that, it means that you can end up lowering costs. And I, I won't relitigate all of that, but I talked about all that before as to how that ends up lowering your cost. It ends up making it easier for the designer to communicate their intent, and it makes it easier for the manufacturer to know what the designer intended so that they don't make mistakes that then they get called for later by the designer that the manufacturer had no way of knowing that the designer wanted. Okay, so with these standardized symbols, we can actually do this thing like control our design intent. And even without fully understanding what all of these uh, feature control frames mean yet at this point, we can kind of infer some things. Like here, it's saying that uh, we need some perpendicularity 
and we look for the feature of A, right? And so feature A is over here. We haven't talked about that much yet, but you know what you're probably saying is that A and B need to be perpendicular to some level of tolerance, right? Um, same down here, right? A and B need to be perpendicular to some level of, of tolerance down here as well. Or this, I, I really should say, um, that this face right here should be perpendicular to A and B, this face of C, okay? Um, all that to say, you know, these, these symbols mean different things. You'll notice that some of our, like our locations, um, you know, are put in a box now, right? So one of the reasons for that is that they're using this positional control, right? That's what that little crosshairs is going to mean. And so these are two dimensions that are used uh, with respect to trying to control um, the location of that hole, right? The diameter of the hole is specified right here, and then the location of the hole is specified using this positional control. Again, we'll get into that at some point. Um, there's another factor right here. They're controlling the flatness of this face right here, right? That's what that little um, symbol means is flatness. So compare this against what our traditional coordinate dimensioning system was that we looked at before. There are so many things that are now sort of controlled on this drawing relative to that drawing, and it means that now if you gave this drawing to a manufacturer, if they came back with a part that looked like this, you would be able to look at your drawing and say, no, you can't have that, uh, that face that's not perpendicular to that other face. I told you it needed to be perpendicular within some range, right? Um, or the hole, you know, um, the hole can't be um, off a little bit. I told you it needed to be perpendicular to the surface where you were doing the drilling relative to, right? So by communicating better, it keeps you from getting back a part like this from a manufacturer after you have specified it as a designer uh, according to what you wanted. So this is my last little thing that I'm going to kind of talk through here, and it's this idea of uh, datums and tolerance zones. These are some of the big ideas of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. The first one is this idea of a datum. A datum is really just a plane or a line or a point that specifies a zero point. It's like where you are going to be measuring certain dimensions relative to. When you're doing manufacturing, um, one of the difficult things, if you've just got maybe a hunk of material that you're then going to try to cut out into a particular part, you need to know where your zeros are for that piece of material because most of your machines, especially if, it's like, especially if it's like a normal machine tool, you're going to be able to do dimensions like, like coordinates relative to your zero points on that part. It's a good idea for you to be able to set up where those zeros are going to be located. And so very often as a designer, you do that by setting up what's called a datum. It means this is going to be my zero point. I'm going to measure my dimensions relative to that zero point. It's kind of a callback to this idea of that baseline we talked about a minute ago with respect to tolerance stack up. Um, a datum is very often what kind of takes the place of that idea of the baseline um, whenever you're doing going to this GD&T kind of a system of, of specifying uh, tolerances of everything that needs, you know, not just tolerances but also the dimensions themselves, specifying what those need to be. They're going to be often be specified uh, relative to uh, a datum. Okay, um, so that, I guess maybe a couple of the things I'll mention here. If you have like a datum plane, which is a very often, a very common way to do that, um, the problem is with a real part, once we've identified that there is no such thing as a perfect form in terms of the plane of one of the surfaces, well then how do you even have a datum? So my point that I'm going to make here is that datums, the true datum, is this theoretically perfect piece of geometry, very often a plane, right? But it can be other things too, right? Nothing we have is actually perfectly planar. And so what we have are a couple of things relative to that idea of the perfect plane. You have uh, something that you use sometimes, it's called a datum feature simulator, right? And that's basically something that we set up. It says here a granite surface plate, right? It's something we set up that's as close to planar as we know how to make, right? And we'll use that to, to sort of allow the part to sort of find its, its uh, zero point against this thing called a datum feature simulator, okay? Um, on the other hand, you might have a datum feature, right? And that is the part's actual physical surface that maybe is supposed to roughly be planar. You know that it's not, and yet you want it to be as close as possible, right? So anyway, that datum feature is not the true datum. The datum is just an idea, right? It's this, in this case, it's an idea of a plane. And you have a datum feature simulator being this thing that you can sort of set against the datum feature itself to kind of, you know, they, they take the place of uh, the next best thing. Maybe I'll say it that way. The next best thing to having a real true-to-life datum that really is a plane, you take these two features that you try to make as close as you can to being true planes and you use those to kind of specify where this zero point is going to be. All right, another big idea that we use in ge geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is this idea of a tolerance zone, right? So again, no part that we ever make has a perfect form. So if we meant for it to be a cylinder, like we have in this little example that I've shown right here, nothing we make is going to actually be cylindrical. So in order for us to define like 
the range through which it's okay for that feature to be, what we do is we define in terms of perfect geometrical ideas again, in terms of like a perfect cylinder. You define one perfect cylinder that represents the outer limits of what the you know thing that's supposed to be a cylinder can be, and then you have another cylinder that's inside, uh, you know, where the the uh, actual cylinder that's not really a cylinder is going to be, right? And you say the space between those two cylinders represents my tolerance zone, and as long as all of the points of my thing that's supposed to be a cylinder lies between those two perfect ideas of cylinders, then my part meets what I was trying to get it to do, right? Or I was the tolerances that I specified. Okay, so. This tolerance zone, again, is, it's always going to be defined relative to these sort of perfect theoretical geometrical boundaries that can be cylinders, they can be planes, they can be other things too. Um, and what they do, what that does is it gives us a range in which, you know, as long as all the points of the part we make exist between those two uh, limits of the range, then the manufacturer can say that they made that part uh, like you asked them to make it. Okay, so that's, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, this idea of tolerance zones, right? Um, it's related, I'll go ahead and throw this piece of this terminology in there, it's very much related to what's called um, the, uh, the actual mating envelope. Um, so that has to do with two parts that mate and whether or not the, there's an envelope where um, they will kind of be allowed to mate with each other the way that they're supposed to. We'll get into that more later also, but for now just think about datums and tolerance zones. All right, um, I should actually mention this as well because there there are more than one standard out there for being able to do geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Um, the one that we are going to be using in this course, um, and the reason we're using it is that it's, it's what the chapter in the book that we're using uses, um, but the one that we're going to be using is the ASME Y14.5-2009 standard. Now there is this you know slightly newer standard out there, 2018. Um, now the thing is, for the, the level of stuff that we're going to be learning, I know of no um, big differences between the 2009 standard and the 2018 standard, but I just figured I'd mention that for this course we're going to be learning about the 2009 standard um, of this geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. These have to do with the year, by the way, um, goes back to a 1994 standard and earlier than that a 1982 standard, and actually it goes even back further than that in terms of the idea of how this thing was set up. But let's talk a little bit about maybe some um, some of the differences between the ASME version of the GDNT standards versus there's another one put out by um, ISO, right? As a matter of fact, I just picked out one of the ISO standards to kind of label this thing. That's one of the big differences is that between ASME and ISO, ASME kind of collects all of their GDNT standards into one standard. It's got one label on it, in our case 14.5-2009, right? And everything's in there. With the ISO, they've got a series of standards that all relate to each other right, but they all have kind of different numbers on them, and so this is just one of those numbers. So that's where that first bullet right there says there's also many more uh, standards that are related, okay? So let's talk about kind of more differences than that. The ASME standard really has a focus on what did you mean to do with your design? So I say their design intent, and then related to that very much is this idea of specification. You're the designer, what do you want to specify um, your part to be, okay? Contrast that with this ISO standard, it has an emphasis on metrology and verification, right? It means a little bit more than, than just your design intent, it's how would you know whether or not it was achieved? Like how would you measure it to know whether or not what you wanted is what you got, okay? Um, and so each of these has kind of their, uh, their strengths to them. Um, and then the other thing they say down there is as, you know, more than specification, the emphasis in ISO is more of a verification, which again has to do with met metrology. How would you know whether or not you got close enough to the thing that you were trying to do. And kind of by its, you know, it's a necessity then at that point, if this is your emphasis, you have to have more standards and that would have to do with how would you go about measuring to know whether or not you, um, you got what you were specifying in, in your part, right? Um, in the ASME standard, it does not specify exactly how things have to be made or how they have to be inspected or how you would know whether or not you got in the range that you would want. That's, you know, that's kind of a, it would have to be uh, an additional step that would have to go into knowing whether or not um, something was met, like a goal was met as far as how something was made. Okay, um, The ASME standard changes much more slowly, right? So they try to get these big ideas put into the ASME standard and then not change it um, very frequently, okay? Um, whereas on the ISO side, the, um, you know, those standards tend to change a lot more quickly and they tend to change more significantly when they do change. So each has their strengths, right? If, you, if something is not working as far as how uh, you're supposed to be specifying um, or, or knowing how to verify whether or not something's the right shape or size or anything like that, if, if there's something that's not working in practice, 
ISO tends to have the philosophy of, well, let's get that fixed as soon as possible. Whereas ASME tends to change more slowly and say, you know, even if it's not working perfectly yet, let's kind of keep it left alone until we figure out exactly what a better system might be later on. And I hope I'm being fair to these two, but this is how I understand it. Um, there's no, one last big difference that exists between the ASME standard and the ISO standard. And earlier I was talking about when you have a tolerance zone, and let's say you're trying to get a cylinder inside of maybe two theoretical cylinders. Um, you're trying to set your thing up to where all the points of your cylinder exist between the outer and inner ranges that would be defined with these perfect uh, ideas of cylinders. Um, the ASME standard says you need to have all points within that boundary. Whereas the ISO standard would do something a little bit different and, the, and it would use more of like a least squares averaging to kind of figure out what that surface really was and then say that that has to be in a certain range for the cylinder. Um, again, each has their own advantage. What's nice about ISO is that um, it actually gives you more specificity about how to specify it. What's nice about ASME is that usually, especially if like what you're trying to do is make a cylinder to fit inside of a hole, it's really important that you have all points inside of that boundary or else you, know, you get one little point that's outside, it might not fit into the hole. The cylinder might not fit into the hole. So again, you see more of that design intent coming in on the idea of all points fitting it in a certain boundary. Um, the downside of this is that at some point, um, you get down to you know like exactly how smooth a surface is or something like that. You can get down to extremely microscopic levels and at some point you do have to start doing averaging. Right? You, you don't ever take, there is no such thing maybe as a true point. That's another way of saying what I'm trying to say. If there's no such thing as a true point, then you can't even know whether or not you've got all points inside the, uh, in the, inside the boundary. So I don't know. These are, these are some of the differences between the standards. Again, we're going to be using that 2009 standard. And uh, I think I had a picture up here just to kind of remind us about this idea of all points being inside of the boundary versus um, more of an averaging technique that's used in the ISO version. All right, so um, let's kind of wrap things up here. So um, I hope that one of the things I've gotten across is that by using these new standards or these kind of more specific standards um, like the ASME Y14.5-2009, it can save cost, right? You can communicate better with your potential suppliers, manufacturers, which will lead to less scrapped work. Um, you won't have as many disputes and, and just that can cost a lot of money, right? You have a legal dispute or something with a you know, between a, um, a designer and a manufacturer and uh, you know that can cost money right there just that you've had that you had the dispute so that can end up costing less if you have fewer disputes um, and then like I mentioned earlier you have more choice in who you might be able to get to supply something because the better you can specify what you want the more it commoditizes it and it makes it to where a multitude of suppliers might be able to make it instead of that one favorite supplier only who somehow knows what you need um, where the other suppliers might not. Um, the other thing that GD&T does is it provides these tools to designers and it makes a designer feel more comfortable being able to specify exactly what they want. Um, you know, one part of that is this system of symbols that, you know, now there's this idea, big, big idea that comes behind just one little symbol and it makes it more compact to write what you want on machine drawings, right? So that's a reminder that we have those symbols. Um, along with that comes these uh, control frames. It gives you this nice sort of standardized way of writing it is, writing what it is that you want on your machine drawings. Um, the other thing that we've got is all of these symbols represent these ideas of ideal uh, part geometry. Like there's this ideal um, idea of a plane or idea of a, of a cylinder or anything. And we get to specify not only what those ideal values are, but also um, a zone with which, within which uh, those, as long as everything stays within this zone. So it's not just like one cylinder, it's this range between two cylinders. And it specifies what those limits are where the, uh, the size of something or the shape of it is acceptable versus if it goes outside those limits, it's not, right? And of course, I, I put these down here on purpose where I kind of specify that these four big fundamentals of GD&T, again, are size, location, orientation, and form, right? And everything that we're gonna be specifying is going to be either one or some combination of these various factors that we're going to try to control. And by controlling them, we're going to make our parts uh, better specified. So uh, I know this was, we didn't do necessarily a lot of like heavy meat in today's lecture, um, but I, I wanted to at least sort of introduce this big idea of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. And I hope it's been useful to you and I hope it maybe whets your appetite for what some of the other things are that we're going to cover uh, in this course. Um, if you're just uh, someone who randomly found me on the internet and watched this, I hope that seeing this um, inspires you to, to find the other videos. Um, that if they are not posted yet at this time when you found it, they will be posted very soon. And uh, I hope you'll check those out as well. 
Uh, thank you for watching, and uh, if you feel like these videos are valuable, I always appreciate it if you'll subscribe. I always appreciate it if you'll recommend my videos to other people who might be interested. And so I appreciate your, your time, and I uh, hope you have a blessed day.